The Islamic Connection is the name of this lecture, and it's quite a story. The Islamic religion is huge today, and it has some very fascinating features. It's a very exclusive religion. Nobody from the outside is allowed in. If there are pilgrimages to Mecca, only those of the Islamic faith are allowed to go to these pilgrimages. It is an exclusive religion. Evangelism in Islamic countries is totally forbidden. This religion has full control of the entire territory which it controls. Now, who and what is Islam? Millions of people make the pilgrimages to Mecca where they worship at the shrine of Muhammad. What a privilege it is for them to make the pilgrimage. There's another religion which also propagates pilgrimages, and that is Catholicism. So you have pilgrimages to Lourdes and the Marian sites and to Fatima. Pilgrimage is a symbol of the great pagan religions of the past as well. Now, who was Muhammad? Muhammad Mustafa was born in 570 AD and he died in 632 AD. He fled to Medina in 622 AD after Qadiyah's death. Now, who was Khadija? Muhammad married Khadija when he was 25 and she was 40 years old. Her cousin, Varakwa, was a Roman Catholic and she came from a Roman Catholic convent. So we could say she was a Roman Catholic nun. She was super rich. She lived in a convent and she had um, the whole of the economy, basically, in her hand and she employed this young man, Muhammad, whom she then also married. Muhammad marched on Mecca in 630 AD, two years before he died and four years before Omar became caliph and the Quran was compiled in 650 AD and Muhammad, who couldn't write himself, had a scribe to write down what he saw and what he heard. And the Quran is different, apparently, from all other religious writings because it was a directly dictated book. So it is not just transcribed by a prophet, so they teach, but it is the very word of God and therefore it must always remain in its original Arabic language. That is what is taught in the Islamic religion. The symbol of Islam is the sickle moon and the star. The star within the sickle moon. Now where does this symbol come from? And who is Allah? Well, let's go to uh, some interesting quotes, also from encyclopedias of religion and etc. Allah, he was the moon god who married the sun goddess. Together they produced three goddesses who were called the daughters of Allah. These three goddesses were called Alat, al Uzza, and Manat. The Encyclopedia of Religion mentions that Allah is a pre-Islamic name corresponding to the Babylonian bell. Fascinating. So this is an ancient pagan religion, and Baal, or Baal, is the deity. We read in Morals and Dogma, page 451, the Arabian word El Debaran means the foremost or leading star, and it could only have been so named when it did precede or lead all others. The year then opened with the sun in Taurus and the multitude of ancient sculptures, both in Assyria and Egypt, wherein the bull appears with lunette or crescent horns and the disk of the sun between them are direct allusions to important festivals of the first new moon of the year, and there was everywhere an annual celebration of the festival of the first new moon when the year opened with Sol, the sun, and Luna, the moon, in Taurus. And the symbol of Taurus is that one over there. The crescent and disc combined always represent the conjunctive sun and moon. That means basically the male-female deity. Adoration of the celestial cow, Mehet Veret, there's the all-seeing eye, uh, the eye of Osiris. Here are the horns, there is the disc in the horns, and it also represented the plunging of the sun god into the womb 
of the mother to be born by Isis. So the horns are also a representation of the moon, the sickle moon. So in later religions or from Babylon itself, Assyrian style, there you have the half moon with a solar disk in it. And the same over here, enlarged, note that this is Baal Hadad, the birth of the sun. If we go to Mesopotamia, we'll find the old symbol of Baal and Bel was exactly the same, the half moon and the star in it, representing the birth of the sun. Isis and Osiris, the male-female aspect. So this would be Ashtoret and Tammuz, or Isis and Horus, the male-female. The same you find in Egyptian, as we have already discussed it. This is Baal worship, this is Lucifer worship, in his male-female form. Now, the papacy has exactly the same thing, because the Pope is today the representative of the Babylonian religion. So when he says the Mass, he has a round wafer disc, its roundness coming as a symbol of Baal. And after a Mass, it is placed in a monstrance, which is a half moon. So then you have the birth of the sun, and you have it symbolized in this form. Here's another monstrance in which the host is placed representing the birth of the sun. So Catholicism uses the symbol of the half moon with the sun or the star in it. Here's a Roman Catholic church in Germany, and it has this interesting clock on it, which I photographed. There's the moon, and there is the star. And this particular star here has eight points. And as this clock moves round, of course, every time, the long arm and the short arm intercalate, you have the birth of the sun god. Boom. Baal Hadad, Baal Hadad, Baal Hadad, every now and then, every hour of the day. Very interesting. So the symbol of Catholicism is the moon and the star, hidden, of course, in many other symbols as well. Now, this ancient religion existed before Islam. And the initiates of this religion, as we saw in Morals and Dogma, were the insiders, like Oregon, for example, and the Bishop of Alexandria. These were the initiates who harbored the ancient religion. And they were Christian, so-called, but of course they were not Christian. They just propagated that for the Goyim, Catholicism. True Christianity, they fought tooth and nail and tried to eradicate, and they tried to eradicate the Word of God, as we saw, by changing it. Now, Islam arrives on the scene way after that. So the true harborers were in Christianity before they were in Islam, and they were in two places, Alexandria and Rome. Alexandria was eventually taken over by Christianity, and the bastion, the great library, was destroyed, and the final seat of the occult knowledge was in Rome. So Rome is the seat of the ancient occult knowledge before Islam even appeared on the scene. That is the fact. And this ancient occultism had a potent enemy. Who was that enemy? Christianity. Christianity was growing in the place where the disciples had taught it. Christianity was growing in the heartland of the Middle East, Asia Minor, all the way up to India, the Bible says, into the north of Africa. That is where true Christian doctrine prevailed. They kept the Sabbath. Only Alexandria and Rome did not keep the Sabbath. Alexandria soon disappeared as a seat, and then the Sabbath was not kept in Rome. Very interesting history. So the symbol that Catholicism uses is the star and the sickle moon. And this star, by the way, is exactly the same star as is used in Islam. Isn't that interesting? I wonder who gave rise to whom. Obviously the one who is first can only give rise to the one who comes second, and not the one second give rise to the one who comes first. Isn't that correct? If we think about it. So, in Catholicism, we find the half moon, or the sickle moon, where the deity is in them. We find Mary, 
replacing Jesus Christ as the mediatrix of all graces. The mediator, the sole mediator and advocate is replaced by Mary. So here in this Roman Catholic monastery, Christ puts the crown of thorns onto Mary and she has the holes in her hands. Mary is always depicted as coming out of a cave. Now the ancient deities always came out of a cave. Loyola, the Jesuit, received all his information in a cave and it is interesting that Muhammad received all of his information in a cave. That's paganism. That has nothing to do with Christianity. Now here we see in Islamic countries, in uh, this particular one over here, we have this strange structure over here and we have a statue of Mary on top of it. And Mary there appeared apparently as this little gazelle. But before the king shot it, it changed into Mary and she told him to build a monastery. And uh, that she did, or that he did, and there is the monastery high up on a hill. Now whenever I find a monastery high up on a hill, I'm very interested because high hills were pagan high places where they sacrificed to pagan deities. It is interesting that all the cathedrals in the world are built on pagan places of worship. Even the Vatican is built on a pagan site of worship. Nothing has changed. So when I came to this particular place in the Middle East, I went to look for the ancient place of worship and sure enough on the hill there it is, the triple arches of the ancient deity of sacrifice in the cave as per usual. It's interesting that Mary always appears in the cave, in Fatima she's in the cave, in Lourdes she's in the cave, the Pope is always visiting the cave and worshipping in the cave. As Osiris represented the sun in Egyptian law, Isis represented the moon, but the truth is that Osiris represented the male active generative powers of nature, while Isis represented the female passive or prolific powers. That's Encyclopedia of Freemasonry. So it's actually a form of nature worship. These, these people would do well in the Bohemian Grove, worshipping the trees. The Templar rev revelation identifies Isis as the Black Madonna on no less authority than a former head of the Priory of Zion. The Black Madonna cult is century to the Priory of Zion. To them at least there is no doubt about the significance of the Black Madonna. You see, Osiris was both black and he was white. And he's worshipped as black and he is worshipped as white. Mary is worshipped as a Black Madonna and as a White Madonna. So we have all these interesting nuances. The Hittites used the symbol of the half moon and uh, the solar deity. This symbol today, of course, is used by none other than the United Nations. Well, let us travel to an Islamic country today. Here is a Catholic cathedral in Amman. And uh, I'm photographing this Catholic cathedral standing at the mosque. <laughs> So I'm standing on the ground of the mosque and I'm photographing the Catholic cathedral right opposite. Now, it's interesting how Catholicism and Islam stand side by side in all the Islamic countries. And every time, I'm so surprised to see the cathedral and the mosque next to each other. You see, if you know the inside religion, behind the scenes they're actually the same. So if I look at the symbolism on the outside of the Catholic cathedral, I have the symbol of the sun, because it was the symbol of the sun worship. And the cross, of course, the symbol also of the sun god. And there is the symbol of the sun. If I go across the street, and there is the great Abdullah Mosque, one of the finest, built by King Abdullah. On the gates you have the symbols of the sun. Same symbolism, same religion. On top, of course, now here you have the moon, the sickle moon, which the Catholic Church had on the clock. It was a symbol of Baal, or Baal. Inside this mosque, there are of course no pews, because in Islam you bow down and kneel on the floor on the carpet. And if you look up at the tremendous dome, you have again the great solar blazes in this wonderful building. Islamic dress, well, you can look at old-fashioned Catholic nuns and you will find that the dress is identical. Catholic nuns wear the same dress as Islamic women 
of Orthodox faith. This is uh, the great mosque in Damascus. Fascinatingly, inside the mosque, right inside is the shrine, and there is a Muslim man praying at the shrine. Now, who's he praying to? Is it to Allah there? No. He's worshipping a relic of the dead. Because this is the shrine of none other than John the Baptist. Now, if you know something about Johansenites, we've spoken about that, then you can already pick up, if you pick up the name John, you have Johansenism, then you have secret societies blended in the background. And they claim that this place has the head of John the Baptist. So an Islamic shrine in Damascus, this is, by the way, the oldest mosque, the most illustrious, in uh, that country has this head. Fortunately, the Roman Catholic Church has a shrine with the arm of John the Baptist. I always say if they carry on, they might be able to put him together again. I don't know. So it is the same form behind the scenes. Inside the mosque, the women are not that important. They are relegated to the side. The men get the central positions. They are praying there with beads. In Catholicism, you pray with beads. You pray with rosaries. Now, which other religion has the priesthood just for men? The Roman Catholic Church is exactly the same. And here you have the same position in the Islamic world. The Islamic all-seeing eye this is a very prominent structure that is used in all of Islam. And you will not find a taxi cab anywhere in the Islamic countries that will not have the all-seeing eye there as a protection. Of course, it's used in Catholicism as well, and it's on the US dollar and all these interesting places. There's, of course, the eye of Hathor, the eye of Osiris on an Egyptian temple. There it is on a Roman Catholic pulpit. Another one on a Roman Catholic cathedral. Masonic author Carl Claudy writes, this is one of the oldest and most widespread symbols denoting God. We find it in Egypt, in India, the open eye of Egypt represents Osiris. In India, Siva is represented by an eye. And the Encyclopedia of Freemasonry says, the all-seeing eye is an important symbol of the supreme being borrowed by Freemasonry from antiquity. On the same principle, the Egyptian represented Osiris. So, Islam uses the symbol, Catholicism uses the symbol. I'm just showing you some comparisons. To the ancient Egyptians, the right eye symbolized the sun, the left eye the moon. So there you have, again, the two aspects of the sun god. Bailey then goes on to mention, this is Alice A. Bailey, that the eye of God is Shiva, or Siva, the destroyer. Remember, Shiva is the Indian god, who is the equivalent of Osiris. Shiva is also a synonym for Satan. Is it possible that both religions in the inner circle worship the same Lucifer, but that the outer court knows nothing about this? Well, who was Baal? Encyclopedia of Freemasonry. Whenever the Israelites made one of their almost periodical deflections to idolatry, Baal seems to have been their favorite idol. In Tyre, Baal was the sun, Ashtoreth the moon, and so we have all the evidence that they know exactly what they're doing. There is no contradiction here, for Set is the Egyptian devil and Shiva is the Indian god of destruction. Both names, Set and Shiva, are listed in the Satanic Bible as another name for Satan. And Elena Petrovna Blavatsky affirms, now we have to remember that Siva, Shiva, Palestinian Baal, or Moloch, and Satan are identical. Is it possible that both religions serve the same master behind the scenes and that the masses are deceived, just like in Catholicism? Beautiful people who are kept ignorant. And the sincerity of the Muslim duped and misused because they are goyim, catechumens. Elena Petrovna Blavatsky links Set to Satan. Hermes, the god of wisdom, is called Tot Tot Set Satan. All of these. Ancient Egypt's Satan, Set was worshipped under obscene homosexual rituals. 
and they had temples in which they had these homosexual rituals. For example, the Luxor Temple. Uh, I have them, but I won't show them. Now, this is an ancient pagan site, the Luxor Temple, one of the great uh, relics of past times. Now, here we're going into the entrance, and oops, what's that? That's a mosque. Now, where's that mosque built? You, you don't mean the mosque is built into the Luxor Temple? Is that possible? Well, let's go a little bit closer. Yes, there it is. It's in the Luxor Temple. What does that tell you? If you had to build a Christian church today, would you go and choose the ancient pagan temple of Baal and build your church right in it? Yes or no? No, of course not. But what if the secret religion is really the same old ancient religion of Lucifer worship? Would you then perhaps do it? Perhaps, yes. So there they've done it. It's built into that temple. Amazing. On the ruins. Now let me take you to the temple of Baal, which is in another country, in Lebanon. And there it is. And on the Baal site, which is the same deity, by the way, oh, what is that? That is a Roman Catholic place. A Roman Catholic Church, on the same site. There is the cross, there's the Temple of Baal. Why build it on the same site? Why have the same rituals? Catholicism does it, Islam does it. Do you think they have an agenda? And if we go into the great Catholic places, this is the place where Mary apparently ascended. Here is the great cathedral in Jerusalem. On the floor you have the solar circle with all the signs of the zodiac, which by the way, God forbids. God forbids. And this is the place where Mary lay and then she ascended, uh, of course, to heaven. She didn't stay dead there. On the floor you have the pagan symbols, you have all of these interesting mitzotoms and what have yous, and the pentagrams, upside down pentagrams, all symbols of Lucifer, and then in the paintings, this interesting star. This is actually two squares, one inside the other, and that is how the pagan deities were represented very often, either as triangles, one within the other, or as squares, one within the other. And the squares, one within the other, were often used for Isis and Osiris. There you see it in the Roman Catholic Church, dedicated to Mary. Also on the floor of that Roman Catholic Cathedral, you have the boat, you have the waves, the water, you have the P and the X. Remember that morals and dogma told us that that was the staff of Osiris. So that means it's actually a male phallic symbol, and the boat would be the womb. This is a very naughty picture in a nice setting. Nobody would know what that really means. Nobody would really guess that that is an obscene picture. Unless you read what the Masons say about it. Now isn't it interesting that the ship with its mast in the half moon was also the same depiction. So here is a Roman Catholic cathedral built like a Phoenician ship. Now what has a Phoenician ship got to do with Roman Catholicism? Unless of course it is the womb. Now let's ask Albert Pike to explain this to us. Albert Pike writes that Isis and Osiris, the active and passive principles of the universe, were commonly symbolized by the generative parts of man and woman. The Indian lignum was the union of both, as were the boat and mast, and the point within the circle, all of which expressed the same philosophical idea of the union of the two great causes of nature, blah, 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 blah. So, we're still on track here. We find this in the Roman Catholic Church. Inside this knight's temple, We've been there before, but I want to show you something else. Remember last time I showed you the double-headed eel? But I'm now going to point your attention to the floor. Oops, what is that? That's an eight-pointed star. Now, who does the star represent? Well, there's the star of Islam. Isn't that interesting? The two are identical. There's the star of Islam in various forms. 
So we find the star in Islam, we find it in the Catholic cathedrals, we find it especially dedicated to Mary, and we find it in the Islamic world. Now, how does the star come into existence? It's simply a square within a square, and there you have it. If you want to have the Star of David, you just take the triangle within the triangle, and you have it. There you go. It's a sex symbol. It's occult. It's very occult, in fact. So now, here's an interesting story of a man who claims to have been a Jesuit. His name is Alberto Rivera. And he claimed that Cardinal Bear, the Jesuit general, personally instructed him on the origin of Islam. According to Rivera now, the Roman Catholic Church started Islam on purpose to take the Arabs under their control and to secure Jerusalem. Fascinating. This is, of course, highly ridiculed in the literature. Nothing like that ever happened. But uh, let me digress and speculate a little bit. Who was first, Catholicism or Islam? Catholicism was first. And Catholicism had a major problem. You see, the Byzantine church initially was on the side of Rome, no problem. In fact, the Byzantine emperor elevated the Roman pontiff to his level of corrector of heresies of the entire world. So yes, the Byzantine church and Rome were initially one. Only after about a thousand years it did a split come between the Orthodox and the Catholic Church. When the Orthodox Patriarch refused to accept and acknowledge the supremacy of the Bishop of Rome. And then war broke out between these two groups and has been waging since after the Russian Revolution. Now the Orthodox Church is saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So that's been resolved. But in the first few hundred years of Catholicism's rule, what was the main problem of Catholicism? Who was the problem? The true Christians. The true Christians, because Christianity had spread in the Middle East. Wouldn't it be nice if these supposed Christians of Rome could use an organization to eradicate Christianity and replace it with another form of their religion? Front organizations. They're very good at it. You know, the Jesuits created who? Freemasonry to do the work. If something, they ban Freemasonry, and if something happens, they say, oh, it wasn't us, it was Freemasons. Isn't that right? Or they blame the Jews. No, it's not us who rule the world, it's the Jews, it's them, it's Zionism. But in actual fact, it's Catholicism. Now, if the occult world wanted to gain control, and the occult world controlled Rome, why not control all occultism? Wouldn't that be interesting? I'm just speculating. I can't prove this. I'm just saying that that's what Rivera said. Rivera said nobody believes him. So let's have a look at what happens. Fatima is a very interesting place because Islam controlled Spain and Portugal once upon a time. And the Pope is here in front of the statue of Fatima. There's the shrine, the Fatima link. A Vatican insider, Dr. Malachi Martin, has said that based on the message of Mary in a personal visitation, John Paul believes there will come a day when the heart of Islam, already attuned to the figures of Christ and of Christ's mother Mary, will receive the illumination. I like these words. You know, they, they sort of ring once you get to know them. It needs a second Fatima, in which they will recognize him as God's vicar on earth. So who must be recognized as God's vicar? The Pope must be recognized as God's vicar. Then, with fellow travelers like the Church of England, the Episcopal Church, and others of like mind, the Pope could be worshipped as the infallible Holy Father by over one half of the world's population. I'd like to correct him. All of the world's population. But that's besides the point. Now, early Islam. Which area did it occupy? This area. This area. Who ruled over here? Who ruled there? Only Christianity. Before there was Islam, that is where Christianity was. And so Islam took hold of this area. Then by AD 750, Islam progressed and took over all this, including Spain. That's fascinating. Spain, 
and all this Asia Minor area was controlled by Islam. Did you know who ruled in Spain? It was the Visigoths. And the Visigoths had a different gospel to Catholicism. They were more in line with the Ostrogoths, who actually were Sabbath keepers. Problem people that had to get sorted out there maybe for a while, just speculating. AD 900, there they go, withdrawing from the north of Spain. The Franks were very strong Catholic supporters. Slowly, slowly, Islam is moving out. And there, this whole area controlled now by Islam. 1,100, they're in the south of Spain. In the south, there's a group which is more independent than in the north. Tremendous battle, the Spanish area. And then they control this area, and AD 1500, they're out of Spain. The West Roman Empire is totally Catholic. This is Catholic. And Rome controls the Catholic world. And Islam controls this area. Today, this is the Islamic distribution, and there are two uh, sects, the Sunni and the Shia, and they control vast areas, a huge area. But initially, where Christianity was, today you can put Islam. Gary H. Carr, remember, speaks of the ancient mystery religion controlled by Freemasonry and the Illuminati and the World Council of Churches. Now, what if the true mystics behind the scene, the power mongers, are really in Rome, and that they control everything, including this other religion, through insiders. And then, if you put all the pieces together with all the references that there are, there are tremendous links between the Templars and the Islamic secret societies. The Ismailis, the Karmatites, the Fatimites, the Druzes, and the Assassins. Now, the Assassins were interesting because they would kill themselves to gain an advantage. They could blow themselves up. Blow themselves up to destroy others. Do we have something like that today? Oh, yes. So nothing's changed. History is repeating itself. Now, who were these secret societies that were in cahoots with the Templars, or did the Templars control them? Who knows? Let's read about the Assassins. Degrees of the Assassins was thus as follows. First, there was the Grand Master, known as Shaikh al-Yabal, or Old Man of the Mountain, Second, the Dial Kerbi, the Grand Prios. Third, the fully initiated Dias. Fourth, the Rashivs, the Associates. Fifth, the Fadais, the Voted. Sixth, the Lassiks, or Law Brothers. And lastly, the Common People, who were to be simply blind instruments. Does it sound familiar? The poor blind Goyams Katakumans. Designs against religion were, of course, not admitted by the order. Strict uniformity to Islam was demanded from all the lower rank of uninitiated, but the adept was taught to see through the deception of faith and works. So here we have a whole nations subject to these insiders using them as human cattle. Wouldn't you feel sorry for them, like we have to feel sorry for ourselves because we've been duped like that as well? Thus, by the law of paradise, the assassins enlisted instruments for their criminal work and established a system of organized murder on the basis of religious fervor. Nothing is true and all is allowed was the ground of their secret doctrine. The Jesuits have the same doctrine today, which are ever being imparted but to a few and concealed under the veil of the utmost austere religionism and piety, restrained the mind under the yoke of blind obedience. Poor people duped by satanic insiders. Now the Fatimites was another group that took over. The founder of the Fatimite dynasty of the Caliphs was Ubaidallah, known as Mahdi. Societies of wisdom were instituted in Cairo. Dar ul Kimat, or the house of knowledge, by the sixth Caliphah Hakim, who was raised to a deity after his death and is worshipped to this day by the Druzes. Under the direction of this man, the Grand Lodge of Cairo was formed by the Fatimites and continued the plan of Abdullah. And there were a number of degrees, nine in all, their method of enlisting proselytes and systems of initiation, blah, blah, blah. 
are absolutely those which Weishaupt used for the Illuminati. So, you know, there's no difference between Rome and these folks. It's the same organization. Is it possible that they've used thesis and antithesis for thousands of years, if you like, to rub up the remnants of Christianity and opposition? And later, when the Orthodox Church split, what did they do? They created an empire called the Ottoman Empire, which went in and slaughtered the Serbs, who were Orthodox, and slaughtered the Romanians, who were Orthodox. They raped the women, they threw the children in the air, they caught them on the ends of their bayonets, they decimated whole Orthodox areas. Incredible. And what escaped to the north into Russia, it didn't escape the sword of communism, Lenin and his murderous band. There has been a religious war since Christ died. And who is being rubbed up? The souls of men. So here are the men of Islam. Who are these insiders? Who are these ayatollahs? Should the world be afraid? The world is meant to be afraid. Are you with me? So you have thesis, you have antithesis. In the world wars they said communism is the threat. You are supposed to be afraid so that you will accept any changes that are necessary to meet the threat. Now they're using this as the next threat to create the synthesis that they want. They're going to rub up two religions against each other Christianity, Judea, Christian culture, Islamic culture, rub them up and, and destroy each other until what is left? Synthesis. And then you have one world religion and Lucifer rejoices because he's king. Isn't that what Albert Pike said? What he was going to do? Wow. So who are these so-called men of Islam? Well, I had this man down on the screen long before he was fingered as a 33 degree Freemason. I said he was going to be super terrorist number one and they'll probably never catch him. They haven't caught him today. Who knows if he's still alive. We'll talk about him tomorrow. The Bible is an indispensable part of the furniture of a Christian lodge. You remember this text I showed it to you earlier? It comes from Morals and Dogma. Only because it is the sacred book, of, sacred book of the Christian religion. The Hebrew Pentateuch in a Hebrew lodge and the Quran in a Mohammedan one belong on the altar. And one of these, and the square and the compass properly understood, are the great lights by which a mason must walk and work. Which one? Obviously not the Bible, because morals and dogma itself says it hates that Bible. Didn't it say that? We read the quotes. And they changed it all. And the Hebrew Pentateuch, well, that is the Bible. So which one is left? Which one's left? By elimination, the Quran is left. Now, the Quran as such or rightly understood? Probably rightly understood. Why? Because the Quran directly demotes Jesus Christ. It's the book that directly demotes Jesus Christ, whereas the others had to be modified to adjust to the insider to demote Jesus Christ. Are you with me? Now let's have a look at this. This gets fascinating. The deadly deception. James D. Shaw was a 33 degree Freemason, and uh, he was at an interesting ceremony where a very high preacher, very prominent preacher, his first name's Billy, by the way, was also there at his initiation ceremony. But that's another story. 33rd degree, Knights Commander of Court of Honor, past Worshipful Master, Blue Lodge, past Master of all Scottish Rite Bodies. That's what he was. He was a 33 degree Freemason. And he explained some of the rituals. The deadly deception, James D. Shaw, 33rd degree initiation ceremony, the oath is sealed by drinking wine out of a human skull. May this wine I now drink become a deadly poison to me as the hemlock juice drunk by Socrates, should I ever knowingly or willfully violate the same. We've done this before. I'm just bringing it to perspective. A member dressed as a skeleton places his arms around the candidate who then states, 
and may these cold's arms forever encircle me should I ever knowingly or willfully violate the same. So that's the 33 degree initiation ceremony. But there is another one. Each of us was presented along with the Scottish Rite ring, a copy of Albert Pike's book, Morals and Dogma. So you get that when you get to the 33rd degree. We were told that it was the source book for Freemasonry and its meaning. We were also told that it must never leave our possessions and that arrangements must be made so that upon our deaths it would be returned to the Scottish Rite. Fortunately, I didn't have to go through the process, but I have one. I have one. Very useful. Now what's this got to do with Islam? Now this is the highest degree of Freemasonry. What happens there? The deadly deception. The Scottish Rite includes 29 degrees beyond the Blue Lodge. Culminating in the 32nd, the York Rite has the equivalent of 29 degrees of the Scottish Rite in advancement along the path that culminates in the degree Knights Templar. So the York Rite culminates at Knights Templar and the other one is the 32nd degree in the Scottish Rite. Okay. In addition, the shrine. Ancient Arabic order, nobles of the mystic shrine, is available to 32nd degree masons and knights templar who wish to participate. So the highest order is available, those of the highest order and become shriners. The ancient Arabic order, nobles of the mystic shrine, Shrine, the show army of masonry, maintains a very high profile. It is necessary to be a 32nd degree mason for six months before being eligible to join the shrine. Only the highest Freemasons may join the shrine. Now these are most of the prominent Americans, by the way. All the big prominent Americans march through New York as the Shriners in their masquerades. Now, the shrine is in the name of Allah, did you know that? So here are the Christians, of so-called Christians of the 32nd degree, who now know already that they worship Lucifer, come to the shrine with the Quran on the altar. Now the Bible's gone. When you reach the highest level of Freemasonry and you become a shriner, the Bible's gone. We sealed our solemn oath in the name of Allah, the God of the Arab, the Muslim, the Mohammedan, the God of our fathers. Wow. Is Allah the God of our fathers? Here's the oath. In willful violation whereof I incur the fearful penalty of having my eyeballs pierced to the center with three-edged blade, my feet flayed, and I be forced to walk the hot sands upon the sterile shores of the Red Sea until the flaming sun shall strike me with a livid plague. And may Allah, the God of Arab, Muslim, and Mohammedan, the God of our fathers, support me to the entire fulfillment of the same. Can a Christian make such an oath? Yes or no? Obviously not. So masonry is nothing other than the ancient mystery religion and Jesuits are the ancient mystery religion and Islam is the ancient mystery religion behind the scenes and who do you think controls it all? Rome. Rome controls it all. So how would you like it if I said that I believe that Islam and Catholicism behind the scenes is one and the same thing? Have you noticed that Catholicism never complains about Islam not allowing evangelism? Because it suits their purpose, it's already Catholicism. But when evangelism is done in non-Islamic countries and it draws Catholics away, whoo, then you have huge drama. Isn't that interesting? Those are double standards which are hard to understand unless you look behind the scenes where you have all these Egyptian rooms and the Syrian rooms. And here is a Masonic Lodge, the Freemason Lodge meeting in Cairo, President Gamal Abal Nasser, President Nasser, 1954 to 17, Anwar Sadat, 1970 to 1981. They were all members of the AEO, the Ancient Egyptian Order, and of the ANOMS, the Order and the Arabic Nobles of the Mystic Shrine. So, isn't it interesting that they're all working together behind the scenes? This is all a joke. Here is Judge Racheb Idris, ex-governor, Grand Master of the Sovereign Grand Commander of Egypt. There is the Fez as their symbol. This is uh, a mason himself who showed me in Lebanon that most of the high Muslims were all masons. He himself was a 
Hi, Mason. Anyway, masonry. Let's go to this Masonic temple in Oklahoma. And what do we see? Aha! We see affairs. And we see Arabic symbols. And we see affairs, 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 affairs. And of course, Mosla. Muslim Allah. So Freemasonry at the highest level worships Allah who actually directly is set. Symbol of the, the moon and the star. Well, Arthur Edward Waite says Babel represented a Masonic enterprise. Now what does this mean? Now let's get a little bit deeper into the story. We've seen that before as well. The Tower of Babel. Now that's what the Tower of Babel looked like supposedly. Notice that it is built as a spiral. These are all the representations that you find in the literature. There's another representation of the Tower of Babel. Notice the spiral way in which it goes up to the top. There's a whole host of them. Spiral, 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 circular. There's a strange one, but they're all spirals. Most of them probably look like that. So that was a Masonic enterprise. Now, isn't that interesting? Let's look at this picture again. In an Islamic country, Mary on the spiral, standing on top. Here we have Holy Mary, Queen, circle with a dot in it. Do you remember what Albert Pike said that was? That was the generating principle, like the ship and the mast. Same thing. They use that symbol for Mary. Oh, here's another place. Can you see that over there? There she stands. This is in southern Africa. On the spiral. What is this? That's the Tower of Babel. Here we see it from the front. This one over here in Lebanon. I took this one myself in Lebanon. There she is on top of the Tower of Babel. So who's going to be queen of the new Babylon? Mary. But who is Mary? Mary is Isis. Is she? Here is this church where her figure is with this a Phoenician ship over there. There you can see her silhouette through the window. And there's the painting of her. She is the same thing. In Blavatsky's work, Isis Unveiled, she says, Isis, the Egyptian, had the following. Holy Isis, universal mother, mother of gods, mother of Horus, Nate, mother soul of the universe, virgin, sacred earth, mother of all virtues, illustrious Isis, Mirror Justice, Sacred Lotus, Sister of Astarta, blah, 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 Moon, Queen of Heaven, Model of All Mothers, Isis is a Virgin Mother. Then she continues, in Hinduism, same thing. It's Holy Nari, Mariama, interesting. Mother of Perpetual Fecundity, Mother of the Incarnate God, Mother of Krishna, Eternal Virginity, all the same features all the way through. Then we go to Isis. Roman Catholic litany of the virtues. Same book. This is secret doctrine. Uh, at least Isis unveiled. Holy Mary, Mother of Divine Grace, Mother of God, Mother of Christ, Virgin of Virgins, Morning Star. Very interesting. Mystical Rose, Queen of Heaven. All the same titles. Isis Mary. Now notice this is Isis unveiled. This is Helena Petrovna Blavatsky speaking herself. When Cyril... The Bishop of Alexandria, oh well, what can you expect? Of course it was Alexandria. Had openly embraced the cause of Isis, the Egyptian goddess, and had anthropomorphized her into Mary, the mother of God, and the Trinitarian controversy had taken place. From that moment, the Egyptian doctrine of the emanation of the creative God of Emphet began to be tortured in a thousand ways until the councils had agreed upon the adoption of it as it now stands. So there you have it. There it is. The Bishop of Alexandria made Isis into Mary. So it's the same old worship. So if you go into a Roman Catholic cathedral or a Roman Marian shrine, here I've photographed one in Europe. This is recent. I took this five weeks ago. This is brand new. It's nice to have some new slide. Prayer to the star of the sea. O oh Mary, star of the sea. Who is the star of the sea? Who is the god of the sea? It was Poseidon. It was Osiris. O oh dear mother, I now come to thee with greatest confidence. 
the many miracles which had happened, fill me, poor sinner, blah, blah, blah. Thou, O sweetest mother, O amiable star of the sea, do not let me go away from here without being heard, etc., etc. Thou canst help me, for thou art mightiest after God. I just put that in for the Goyim. They actually believe it is God. Here's this famous Pius, the same one who catapulted Adolf Hitler to power. 1950, dogma of Mary's ascension to heaven. And uh, here is the dogma. We declare that the most blessed Virgin Mary in the first moment of her conception was by the unique grace and privilege of God in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Savior of human race, preserved intact from all stain of original sin. Now, this doctrine is incredibly important because now Jesus has his merits because of his mother and not because of his father. Remember that. Jesus has the traits of his mother. Can I burn that sentence into your head? Jesus has the traits of his mother. That's what this doctrine teaches. I will give you the Protestant preachers saying exactly the same. Interesting. Here, Focus magazine, Maria soll Göttin werden. Mary must become a goddess. Surely the Catholic Church would not permit Mary to be openly called goddess? Weibliche Gottheit? Female goddess? Absolutely, why not? Millions of US Catholics want a godly Mary. Cardinal John O'Connor and also Pope John Paul II, a great Marian honorer, are not averse to the idea. There you go. Mary is God. Of course she's God to the insiders because she is, as Blavatsky said, what? Lucifer. She's Lucifer. All right. That's why in the King James Version we read in Genesis 3.15, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Not even the RSV has dared to change that. Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall crush your head, and you shall bruise his heel. But the Catholics don't like it like that, because the Dewey Rhymes online Bible, which is the Jesuit one, says... I will put enmities between thee and the woman and thy seed and her seed, and she shall crush thy head, and thou shalt lie in wait for her heel. So now Mary is the one who crushes Jesus. It's the other way round. And now, here's a photograph of a Marian appearance in Saitun, Egypt. So the Muslims are looking at this, and here's a fascinating book, Queen of Rome, Queen of Islam, Queen of All. So do we have the same religion here? Let's just check this out. Let's take the Roman Catholic website, Hearts uh, are Roman Catholic doctrine regarding web Mary. This is their doctrine, not me speaking. The one holy Catholic and apostolic church as led by the Bishop of Rome, successor to Peter the first pope, has always venerated the Blessed Virgin Mary, including her sinlessness, the church follows scripture, especially the New Testament, which she herself compiled as perfectly as she follows her tradition. For behold, henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. Luke 1, 48. Then, this is still their, their paper. This is what the Catholics are writing. It is no surprise that the woman would triumph over the red dragon, for scripture says so at the very beginning. Refer Genesis 3.15, which states, And all will establish a feud between thee and the woman, between thy offspring and hers, and she is to crush her. Which, which one are they quoting? Which one are they quoting? The Catholic Jesuit one. Wow! Fascinating stuff. Let's continue. Uh, same webpage. To Mary, the woman of Scripture and mother of men, who keep the commandments and hold fast to the truth concerning Jesus. Oh, that's an interesting statement. That comparison will make such fun as we get a little bit later into Revelation. The church applies the beautiful words, of wisdom, she the glow that radiates from eternal light, she the untarnished mirror of God, because Mary is full of grace, the church through Pope Pius has declared her as conceived immaculate, without sin. Very important. Mary has become known as the Immaculate Conception as a result of the apparition of Lourdes in 1851. She is immaculate, Jesus is sinless just because of her, not because of God, because of her. The Immaculate Conception, or the Immaculate Heart, Catholic Cyclopedia, Book 6, makes it clear that heart in the biblical sense means the inner person. Therefore, the Catholic Church 
says, bishops, united them, consecrate the world to the Immaculate Heart. The whole world has been consecrated to the Immaculate Heart. Now that's fascinating. Let's read a little bit on. This exceptional importance is further confirmed by Mary herself when she appeared at Fatima. Now we have an interesting link. You have seen hell, then come the visions, we've discussed them, the vision of hell, Russia would be consecrated, uh, Pope John Paul II, she didn't mention his name, but he's the one who will suffer, so they said is the third one, and all the world will be uh, dedicated to her immaculate heart. Mary further proclaims that Russia will be converted, and then you have this whole story, the world will be saved by Mary's children those who are devoted to her Immaculate Heart. This is fascinating stuff. Now, let's read an article on the same webpage, Catholic webpage, by none other than the famous Catholic Bishop Fulton Sheen. And see if we can get something from this. In an article, Mary and the Muslims, found in the Mincenti Report, pages 1 to 3, Cardinal Mincenti Foundation considers this exceptionally important. The good bishop says, the Quran, which is the Bible of the Muslims, has many passages concerning the Blessed Virgin. First of, all, first of all, the Quran believes in her immaculate conception. And also in her virgin birth. Her virgin birth. Please note, her virgin birth. Have you got this? She was immaculately conceived, and the mother of Mary was sterile. So who is now the Savior? counterfeiting Jesus Christ. This one. What an affront. The third chapter of Quran places the history of Mary's family in a genealogy which goes back through Abraham, Noah and Adam when one compares the Quran's description of the birth of Mary with the apocryphal gospel. Who says the apocryphal gospels must be accepted as canonical? Who says that? The Vatican said that at Council of Trent. Okay, the birth of Mary, one is tempted to believe that Mohammed very much depended upon the latter. You see, Mohammed was married to a Roman Catholic nun, the whole family was Roman Catholic, and he received his doctrine straight from the pits of the bottomless pit. That's what the Bible says. So this doctrine started spreading. And they used Islam first to counteract Christianity, later on splitting it up to get rid of the enemies of Christ, or to get rid of Christ's followers, and then to get rid of all the enemies of Rome. Both books describe the old age and the definite sterility of the mother of Mary. Isn't that fascinating stuff? Joseph inquired how she conceived Jesus without the Father. Mary answered, do you not know that God, when he created the wheat, had no need of seed, etc.? The Quran has verses of the Annunciation, Visitation, Nativity. Angels are pictured uh, accompanying the Blessed Mother and saying, O oh Mary, God has chosen you and purified you and elected you above all the women of the earth. Do you see the links? Who created who? Did Catholicism create Islam or did perhaps Islam, you think, create Catholicism? Can't be because Catholicism was there before Islam. Same doctrine. There is such a strong defense of the divinity of Mary here in the Quran, in the fourth book, attributed to the condemnation of the Jews, to their monstrous calumny against the Virgin Mary. Now it gets even more exciting. So, the bishop says, the two largest religions in the world believe in the fervent devotion to Mary and hold her virtues in very high esteem. And they say, the Muslims and the, com and the Catholics comprise two billion people. Together, well, we're in control. And all we need then is the Orthodox Church. They also have this. It is true too that there are large numbers of Protestants who hold Mary in great favor. Give up your religion, folks. Join the club or else. We'll see. The great mother Teresa made this point when she summed up the matter in simple and forthright words. No Mary, no Jesus. Isn't that interesting? Wow. Okay. So recognition of the Immaculate Conception by the world will tend to bring a closer relationship between the great Christian denominations, Catholic and Orthodox, as well as between Christianity and Islam. So what is the synthesis they want? A union of the religions. What does Freemasonry teach? 
Well, Jesus, the son of Joseph, the Lord, the Messiah, and the apostles, and after the son of Abdullah, with his law, which is the law of Islam, and the disciples of truth followed the law of Islam. The what? The disciples of truth followed Islam. When Christianity had grown weak, profitless, and powerless, the Arab restorer and iconclast came like a cleansing hurricane. Wow! The faith of the Arab had become stronger than that of the Christian. This is the true Christian. So Islam is nothing else than Catholicism winning over or defeating Christianity. The Gnostics made a soul descend and and ascend through eight heavens and each of which were certain powers blah 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 morals and dogma and then notice what morals and dogma writes about in the ancient doctrine certain genii were charged with the duty of conducting souls to the bodies destined to receive them now you've heard about the genie in the bottle haven't you arabian knights <laughs> rub the bottle and hoo -hoo, here comes the genie now what are these genii now notice that Freemasonry speaks about genii. This is interesting. It gets exciting. I love this detective work. It talks about a familiar genius. Have you heard of the word genius? It comes from genii. Now who are these? These genii are the media of communication between man and the gods. Have you got that? This is what morals and dogma Freemasonry says. The genii communicate between man and God. The Jesus Christ of Islam is different to the Jesus Christ of the Bible, and we'll tell you why in a moment. 1 John 22, who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. We saw how the Catholic uh, scholars changed the Bible to remove Jesus as the sole Savior. Now let me take you to the Quran. This is the Holy Quran with Arabic text, transliteration in Roman script by M. Abdul Halim. This is the international Quran. This is not written about the Quran. This is the real McCoy. I have it. And this comes straight from the explanation by the top theologians on the Quran itself. This is the international version that is used in the United Nations. Let's see what it says. Revitalize humanism. Islam is the message of the Quran. It is perfect and a practical religion of equality, liberty, and fraternity. Where have you heard those words before? French Revolution. Submission to the Supreme Being. Islam also insists upon the fundamental unity of all revealed religions in origin. That's what Freemasonry also teaches. Then they have a section which says, with spirits. There has always been a class, generally called rationalists, mainly including philosophers and scientists, who doubt, now deny the existence of association, speaking with the spirits. While on the other hand, those usually called spiritualists, mostly including saints, and savants and psychics feel sure of spirits and spiritual experience. At one time or other, much fraud was practiced in the name of spiritualism, and etc., etc. But the Quran affirms the reality and approach between the two old parties is already in sight. So the Quran says spiritualism is fine. What does the Bible say? It's satanic. Believe angels. Angels have their own shapes, usually carrying wings. They are formed of they are of easy transformation, and it gives all the scriptures. Angels particularly approach people at the time of their death with good or bad tidings according to the situations. They descend, fear ye not, nor grieve, and they quotes the Quran, smite their faces and their backs, they descend with blessings, etc. etc. And there's another class of beings. What's that? Genii. Now where did we read about them? In Freemasonry. Next to angels come genii, who are formed by fire, the well-known Iblis or Satan, the strand straight in this Quran, being the head of this creation. They had close contact with the prophet Solomon. So in other words, Satan is the head of the genii, 
and the geniuses are the ones, like Plato and the others. And then you get devils, these are the bad guys. So, genii are not bad, and Satan is their head. Is that not interesting? In the Quran. It would appear from the Quran that man is superior to the angels and the genii, they make themselves perfect. Then they talk about six-day periods, and they talk that we came into existence through evolution, and now let's see about the doctrine of Jesus Christ. This is where we're heading. And of Christ in the Bible and the Quran, but the Quran says Christ was altogether saved from the indignity of the cross. Christ never died on the cross. That's what the Quran teaches. Who also teaches that? Spiritualists. The insiders. Because Christ, remember, didn't die for you. Did you see that Hort taught the same thing? Who translated or created the Greek text for the modern Bibles, he said the same thing, that Christ was spared. And as if by a miracle of likeness, someone else of the same features was crucified by the Jews under illusion. Says the Quran, verse 157, And they Jews said in boast, We killed Christ Jesus, the Son of Mary, the apostles of God, in the knowledge of God, but they killed him not, nor crucified him, but it was made to appear to them and those who differ therein are full of doubts with no certain knowledge but only conjectures to follow for a surety. They killed him not. What does that say? Jesus did not die for you. This is satanic occult teaching. Verse 158, Nay, God raised him up unto himself, and God is mighty wise, and there is none of the people of the book but must believe in him before his death. So, the Quran is directly against Jesus Christ and the insiders in the Western world are directly against Jesus Christ and so the Jesuits. While the Jews claim to have killed Christ on the cross, it is also a cardinal point of faith to the Orthodox Christian churches that Jesus Christ gave up his life on the cross. He was buried after crucifixion, on the third day he rose again, blah blah blah, that he met his disciples and was afterwards taken up bodily to heaven. In fact, this is the belief which formed the basis of the theological doctrine of blood sacrifice, vicarious atonement for sins, which is, however, losing its force with the modern age, an age of action and retribution. Isn't that what Hort said? Yes or no? Is there a difference between the Catholic theologians and Islam? Yes or no? None whatsoever. Who is controlling who? God is indignant, says the Quran, the explanation here. God is indignant if Christ is believed to be God himself. Christ is not even the Son of God, but only an apostle like several others. The same hatred for Jesus Christ comes out over here as we saw the theologians influenced by the Jesuits reveal. Now, this is a tremendous quote from the book Home Missionary. I like this quote. <coughs> the Saviour has said, He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. He says again, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Mohammedanism has its converts in many lands and its advocates deny the divinity of Christ. Shall this faith be propagated and the advocates of truth fail to manifest, manifest intense zeal to overthrow the error and teach men of the pre-existence of the only saviour of the world? So basically what I'm doing is I'm showing intense zeal to overthrow the error and to show you that it is a lie. Oh, how we need men who will search and believe the word of God, who will present Jesus to the world in his divine and human nature, declaring with power and in demonstration of the Spirit that there is none other name under heaven given amongst men whereby you may be saved. Oh, how we need believers who will now present Christ in life and character, who will hold him up before the world as the brightness of the Father's glory, proclaiming that God is love. 
I spoke to one Muslim Iman who convert, converted to Christianity. And I said to him, my friend, what is the difference that you have found between your previous Allah and Jesus Christ? And he said, the only difference between the two is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. That is the difference. Allah, a God of war, a God of retribution, a God that sends his people into destruction, promising them celestial virgins on the other side and eternal bliss and hell on earth and hell in heaven for all women. And Jesus Christ who says, we are all equal before God. Nobody has the right to submerge the other's character in himself. You are free agents before Jesus Christ. Yes, it says, wives, submit to your husband. As in the Lord, husbands, love your wife. As the Lord loves his church. My Jesus is my husband in that allegory, if you like. He's never forced me to do anything. Never ever has Jesus forced me to do anything. Anything I do for Jesus Christ, I do because I want to do it. If I want to say to him, goodbye, I'm off. Will he stop me? Will lightning come from heaven and I'll go sizzle fits? No. Jesus is the most fantastic being in the universe. Gives you absolute freedom of choice. Allows you to choose for him or against him, and the only thing he has in his defense is, when I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. Love is the character of God. And love is the only thing that may conquer. Otherwise, we will have perpetual hell. I was asked once by someone, by, well, I won't say... He asked me, but what if the other side wins? Won't you come over? What a strange question. <laughs> I said, you know, I've read the last chapter. Jesus wins. But even if you were right, even if the other side wins, let me tell you something, I'd rather be dead. I'd rather be dead than live a life of perpetual hell under a control freak who has fascism as his government and has puppets who do his will and his bidding. And those that do his bidding, he showers with whatever earthly junk he can give them. But love, which comes from freedom of choice, is incapable of giving. He hasn't got the power to give it. He's nothing to give. He's bankrupt. If Jesus Christ is not victor, we might as well be dust. But thank God, Jesus is going to be victor. This is the message for our time. The Encyclopedia Britannica says, De deviations in the Quran from the biblical narrative are very marked and can in most cases be traced back to the legendary anecdotes of the Jewish Haggadah and the Apocryphal Gospels. Who controls those secret writings? Rome controls them today. Rome says you must believe them. The Jewish Kabbalah, the Zohar, the Zefer Yitz, Ira, those are the ones. And we find uh, writings of Abraham and all of these supposed writings. Now, well, the Zephyr Zetzirah is also said to be the work referred to in the Quran under the name of the book of Abraham. These are the occult writings that create these books. The coming of the Redeemer. What does the Kabbalah and all these say? The abominable calumnies on Christ and Christianity occur not only in the Kabbalah but in the early editions of the Talmud. In it it says about Jesus, that one, such a one, a fool, a leper, a deceiver of Israel. All these terrible words about Jesus Christ. What's this slide doing here? The Pope and actor Jim Caviezel, who acted the part of the Christ in the movie The Passion of Christ, kneeling down before the Pope. Isn't the Pope Papacy uplifting Jesus Christ here? Isn't it? 
Well, if you watch carefully, Mary is the one who receives a lot of attention. Peter kneels down and asks Mary for forgiveness. Yes, if they were to come straight out, nobody would believe, but what if you present a gospel for the goyim and you attract them into this religious net, which at its core is a lie? What about poor Islam? What about exactly the same thing? The outer core is taught Islam with the most rigorous, exacting things that these poor people have to do on a daily basis. And the insiders don't even believe it. They worship Lucifer direct and they're the most licentious of all people. Millions of people being deceived in the world. Isn't that a catastrophe? Should we not stand up and say, God is love, give your lives to him, and split with these lies that are being taught in Catholicism and Islam and in Hinduism and in Buddhism? In Buddhism you sit and you empty yourself until there's nothing left and then you start levitating because you are weightless, you have become nothing. Jesus Christ says, I have come to give you life to the full. I will fill you with myself. And what do all these other religions do? They empty you until you are a shell and there's nothing left of you. What a terrible deception. And all these exacting rules and rituals. It is terrible to, to not have Jesus Christ and the freedom that we have in him. Look at this. This is the truth behind the scenes. Here you have rock stars bowing down before the Pope. You have Yasser Arafat's kissing the Pope's ring. Protestant preachers, what do they say on the issue? Well, let's listen to May 30, 1997 on the David Frost program, Billy Graham said, I think Islam is misunderstood too because Muhammad has a great respect for Jesus. Ha! Has he read what they say? And he called Jesus the greatest of the prophets except himself. Man exalting himself above the Son of God. And I think that we're closer to Islam than we really think we are. Billy Graham, aren't you speaking Masonic language? What about Robert Shuler? Did an interview with Larry King referring to a meeting with the Grand Mufti. Shuler bragged, I have seldom met with a man whom I felt an immediate kinship of spirit and an agreement of faith and philosophy quite like I have with the Grand Mufti of the Muslim faith. What are these Protestant preachers doing? Liking live interview with Robert Schuller, Christmas Eve 1999, King, asking why he met the Grand Mufti and why are you here? The idea of bringing religions together, right? Absolutely, says Schuller. We are in totally new era. The age of being able to indoctrinate people is finished. King, this visit Robert Schuller give you encouragement? Schuller, oh absolutely, the Grand Mufti said religion is like rain that falls, the extremists pollute water. I predict we're going to focus in the next millennium as religious leaders to clean up the pollution in religion. Wow, I think those that don't want to go along with the synthesis, the pain, of the separatenessness is going to become so great that the troublers of Israel, those who say there is no other name under heaven and earth whereby you can be saved, they're going to be in trouble. Maybe this is the last time you will hear a message like this. Who knows? Take note. Benjamin Chavis, he was the former vice president of the National Council of Churches. What did he have to say? He stated that his ministry has always been ecumenical and interfaith. There's a linkage between Judaism, Christianity and Islam and I believe that there should be a great trialogue, not dialogue, but a trialogue between these three great revealed religions. In 1997 he announced he is converting to Islam and becoming a member of Reverend Louis Farcan's Nation, Nation of Islam. He claimed that he still believes in Jesus Christ, but he expects his announcement to shock many of the Christian friends and fellow members of the clergy. And then he goes on to say, he also insists that it really hasn't changed. Nothing's changed. He states, if you pour water from one glass to another glass, the composition of the water is the same. I am who I am. No difference between Islam and Christianity. 
Of course, if you're an insider, there won't be a difference because you're both worshipping at the same, sh same shrine. The God of Judaism is the God of Christianity, is the God of Islam. Sorry, not in my case. My God died for me. They say he didn't die for me. They've got a different one. What's that? The Pope kissing the Quran? Yes. Here's the photo of the Pope at the end of the audience with the Patriarch Raphael of Iraq, where the Pope bowed to the Muslim holy book, the Quran presented to him by the delegation. Of course, I have numerous slides for you where the Islamics come and bow down before the Pope. Catholicism, from the beginning, has controlled Islam. Islam is just a tool of esoterics to indoctrinate people into accepting a synthesis. And we are right at the end of time. Revelation 18 verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. I believe there are many, many people in Islam who will see the light, who will see that they have been deceived, just as there are many, many Catholics who will see the light, that they have been deceived. I myself was a Roman Catholic. Here I am, a living witness to this fact. And the truth has set me free. What a privilege it is for me to pray to my Lord direct. What a privilege it is to me to walk with Him on a daily basis, to experience Him, to know that He exists, to talk to Him, to walk with Him, and away with all these rituals that mean absolutely nothing but bondage. As for me and my household, I would serve the Lord and I would appeal to every Christian to follow the word and do what it says and then none of us will be lost. Thank you very much.